Good morning, everyone. Welcome to my channel. My name is Joshua T. Whaley, and I'm the author of Lost Cannibal Manifesto, amongst other titles. First off, I would like to thank all my new subscribers. I gained a lot of love with 84 of them with the last video. Second, if this is your first time here, this channel is dedicated to the author reading his own words instead of AI-generated imagery and voices. If this sounds interesting to you, please stick around. With that said, let's go ahead and delve into today's video. It will also be for my upcoming book. Let's start. Chapter 48, The Apocalypse of Adam. Our next book, titled The Apocalypse of Adam, is much older than the other ones found in the Gnostic tradition. The roots of this story date as far back as possibly the 4th century BCE. This puts its composition on par with the majority of the other books that make up the Old Testament. But unlike most of the other Gnostic texts, this one does not have any Christian themes other than the coming Messiah. However, like those stories, Adam and Eve were created by the same dark force as found in later Gnostic works, which adds a more extensive time frame to this school of philosophy regarding creation. In other words, there were some Jews who believed that Yahweh was not who he claimed to be prior to the possible teachings of Yeshua found outside and sometimes inside the canonical Gospels. Anyway, the Apocalypse of Adam was one of the books discovered in the Nag Hammadi, proving that it was indeed sacred to early Gnostic Christians and, as we will discover, most likely influenced much later takes on creation. Told in the first person by Adam to his son Seth, the story was first translated into English in 1977 by George McRae as part of the Nag Hammadi Library, and that will be the basis for my interpretation of this story. With that, let's get started. In the 700th year, Adam revealed to his son Seth that when God created him and Eve from the earth, they lived in a glorious realm from which they came, known as the Pleroma or the realm of pure light. In that realm, Eve taught Adam about the knowledge of the eternal God, the All. And they were like the great angels, higher than the God who created them, Yeldabaoth, and the powers with him who they did know. God, the ruler of the realms and the powers, separated them in anger, turning them into two separate beings. Consequently, the glory in their hearts departed, along with the initial knowledge that was within them, and entered another great realm, the earthly realm or the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve did not originate from this realm, but the knowledge entered the lineage of the great eternal beings. That's why Adam named his son after the person who is the seed of the great generation or its forerunner. Subsequently, the eternal knowledge of the God of truth departed from Adam and Eve, and they gained knowledge about inanimate objects and humans. They recognized the God who created them and served him in fear and captivity. After these events, their hearts grew cold, and Adam was troubled by these dark thoughts in his heart. Adam then addressed Seth, I, Adam, encountered three individuals in front of me whose appearance I couldn't identify. They did not belong to the divine beings who created us. They radiated magnificence and told me, awaken Adam from the slumber of death and learn about the everlasting existence and the descendants of the individual from which life has sprung who came from you and Eve, your spouse. Upon hearing these words from the distinguished figures before me, even I fell in a deep sense of sorrow. The Creator, the divine being who brought us into existence, stood in front of us. He remarked, Adam, why were both of you feeling sorrowful in your hearts? Do you not recognize that I am the divine being who created you? I infused in you a life-giving spirit as a living being. Now here is where we learn that Cain comes from the Creator God, Yadabayath, and not Adam. Then the God who created us brought forth a son from himself and Eve, your mother, and I experienced a fond longing for your mother. Our eternal knowledge's strength 
was diminished within us, and feebleness pursued us. Our lifespan was brief. I realized that I had succumbed to the dominion of death. Now, my son Seth, I will disclose what those who I encountered have divulged to me. After I went through the error of this generation and the years of the generation came to an end. Now comes the first prophecy, the great deluge. The earth will be cleansed by the rain showers from God to eliminate all living beings, all flesh, using what is available and will include the descendants of those who received this sacred knowledge from your mother Eve and me. These individuals were strangers and unfamiliar to him. Subsequently, mighty angels on high clouds will transport these people to where the spirits of life resides. The entire population of living beings will be left in the waters. God will cease his wrath and bestow power upon his sons and their wives through the ark, along with the animals and birds of heaven that he selected and released upon the earth. God will then address Noah, also known as Deucalion, and will assure him of protection in the ark for himself, his wife, his sons, their wives, and the animals and birds that were brought aboard. He then entrusts the earth to Noah and his sons, granting them kingly authority over it. They are not to have offspring from those who did not stand in his presence in another form of glory. Some individuals will become like a radiant cloud sent from the knowledge of the great eternal realms and the angels. They will stand before Noah and the realms. Because of this, God will ask Noah, Why have you strayed from what I told you? You have created another generation so you can scorn my power. Noah responds, I testify before your might that the generation of these people did not come from me or my sons. These individuals will be taken to the rightful land where the holy dwelling will be constructed for them. They will be known by the name and will reside there for 600 years in the knowledge of incorruptibility. Angels of the great light will dwell among them and their hearts will harbor only the knowledge of God. Noah then divides the entire earth amongst his sons, Ham, Japheth, and Shem, before advising them to serve God in fear and slavery throughout their lives. Is it not interesting that the term fear and slavery are mentioned again when discussing the Creator God? Noah then implores his children not to turn away from the presence of God Almighty. The sons of Noah assure God that his descendants will serve in humility and fear of what they know, sealed by God's strong hand of fear and command. We hear, we're here in fear quite a bit in this. This will ensure that the entire lineage from him will faithfully serve God Almighty without turning away. Afterwards, 400,000 descendants of Ham and Japheth migrate to a different land and dwell with a group of individuals who possess profound and timeless wisdom. The influence of their strengths shields those with them from all forms of malevolence and pure desires. Subsequently, the descendants of Ham and Japheth established twelve kingdoms, and their other descendants integrate into the realm of other community. They deliberate for ages that have passed away. The immense ages of imperishability. Then they approach their chief archon, Sakla, another name for Yaldabaoth, like Samuel or Yahweh. In ancient Hebrew, the spelling of Sakla here means blind god or fool. They confront the higher beings, accusing the illustrious ones of their magnificence. They questioned Sakla, what is the authority of these individuals who stood in your presence, being descendants of Ham and Japheth, numbering 400,000? They were admitted into a different realm from where they originated. 
and they overturned the entire splendor of your authority and your sovereignty of your control. The descendants of Noah, through his sons, have carried out your wishes, as have all the powers and the dominions over which your supremacy rules. Both these individuals and those who dwell in their magnificence have not fulfilled your desires. Instead, they have diverted your entire assembly. Could that be the Elohim? The God of the realms then graciously grants them some of his faithful servants. They arrive in a land where the pure and noble reside, untouched by any impure desires. Their souls do not originate from impure purity, but rather from the grand command of the eternal angel. Consequently, fire, sulfur, and asphalt are hurled upon those individuals, and a fiery and obscuring mist encircles the realms. Sounds like Sodom and Gomorrah. The eyes of this influential luminaries grow dim, and the inhabitants of these realms are unable to see during these days. Following this event, Large, luminous clouds descend, accompanied by another radiant cloud from the vast eternal realm. Abraxas, Sablo, and Gamaliel descend and res rescue the people from the fire and wrath, transporting them beyond the eternal realms and the rulers of the power. They guide them to the presence of the holy angels and the eternal beings. These people will become akin to those angels, as they are not strangers to them. They will labor with the imperishable seed. The illuminator of knowledge passes by once again for the third time, and great glory to leave some of the seed of Noah and his sons of Ham and Japheth to leave fruit-bearing trees for himself and redeem their souls from the day of death. The entire creation that came from the dead earth will be under the authority of death. But those who contemplate the knowledge of the eternal God in their hearts will not perish. They have not received spirit from this kingdom, but from something else. Something eternal, something angelic. The illuminator Seth will come and perform signs and wonders to scorn the powers and their ruler. The god of these evil powers is then disturbed and says, what is the power of this person who is higher than we are? He then brings great wrath against that person and the glory withdraws and lives in holy houses it has chosen for itself. The powers do not see it with their eyes, nor do they see the illuminator they punish the flesh of the one over whom the Holy Spirit has come. If this doesn't sound like the coming of Yeshua, I don't know what does. The name will be used in error by the angels and all the generations of the power who will ask, where did this come from? Or where did the words of deception which all the powers have failed to realize come from? The illuminator is said by the first kingdom to have come from a spirit of heaven. He was nourished in the heavens, received the glory and power of the heaven, and came to the bosom of his mother, thus reaching the water. According to the second kingdom, he came from a great prophet. A bird took the newborn child and brought him to a high mountain, where he was nourished by the bird of heaven. Next, an angel appeared and told him, Rise, God has given you glory. He then received this glory and strength and thus came to the water. According to the third kingdom, he was born from a virgin's womb. He and his mother were expelled from their city and brought to a desolate place where they were provided for. He received glory and power and proceeded to the water. Could this be Mary and Yeshua fleeing to Egypt? The fourth kingdom's account described his birth from a virgin. Solomon and his armies, along with demons, sought her, but they found a different virgin who was presented to them. Solomon took her, and she gave birth to the child. She raised him on the outskirts of the desert 
and he gained glory and power from the seed of his conception. He then made his way to the water. The fifth kingdom believes that he originated from a heavenly drop, was cast into the sea, and was born from the abyss before being elevated to heaven, where he obtained glory and power before coming to the water. According to the sixth kingdom, a figure descended to the lower realm to gather flowers, became pregnant from the flower's desire, gave birth to him, and was nourished by the angels of the flower garden, receiving glory and power before coming to the water. The seventh kingdom described him as a heavenly drop that descended upon the earth, was brought down to caves by dragons, and was raised by a spirit to the place from which the drop had originated, receiving glory and power before coming to the water. The eighth kingdom describes him as being enveloped by a cloud that covered a rock from which he emerged. He was nourished by angels above the clouds and received glory and power before coming to the water. According to the ninth kingdom, one of the nine muses separated and spent time on a high mountain desiring to become androgynous and eventually became pregnant from her desire. Sounds like the story of Sophia and Yaldabaoth. The angels over the desire nourished the offspring who received glory and power before coming to the water. In the tenth kingdom, it is said that his God loved a cloud of desire, fathering him in his hand and casting some of the drops upon the cloud above him from which he was born. He received glory and power there before coming to the water. The eleventh kingdom claimed that the father had inappropriate desires for his own daughter, who became pregnant by him. She abandoned her child in a tomb in the desert where an angel took care of him until he reached the water. According to the twelfth kingdom, he came from two luminaries and was nourished there, gaining glory and power before coming to the water. The thirteenth kingdom believed that every birth of their ruler represented a word, and this word received a mandate there. His, he gained glory and power, and then came to the water to satisfy the desire of these powers. Could this be the baptism by John the Baptist of Yeshua? However, the generation without a king asserts that he was chosen by God from all the eternal realms. He was imbued with the knowledge of the one of truth and said to have appeared from a foreign air, shining on the whole eternal realm with the people he had chosen. The descendants who will be named upon the water will struggle against authority. A dark cloud will descend upon them. Then the nations will raise their voices, proclaiming, Blessed are those individual souls, for they have truly known God. They will live eternally, have resisting the corruption of their desires and the deeds of the powerful beings. They have stood in God's presence with a knowledge akin to the light emerging from fire and blood. We, on the other hand, have foolishly carried out every deed of the powerful being. We have boasted about transgressing all our works. We have rebelled against the eternal God of the true God. These are the things that trouble our spirits. Now we understand that our souls will perish in death. The three individuals in charge of holy baptism, the living waters, I may screw these names up, Meshu, Makar and Messias addressed the group, questioning their actions and words against the living God, filled with lawless voice and uncontrolled tongues and souls tainted with blood and evil deeds. They accused the group of engaging in works that were not truthful, yet behaving joyfully. By defiling the water of life, they have aligned themselves with the will of the powers they served. They pointed out that the group's thinking was different from those they persecuted and emphasized that the righteous people's words were not written or recorded in a book, 
but would be brought by angelic beings to the great eternal realms. These words would be on a high mountain, a rock of truth, and would be known as words of incorruptibility and truth for those who possess wisdom and knowledge of the eternal God. These revelations were passed down from Adam to his son Seth, who in turn taught his descendants. This hidden knowledge of Adam, the holy baptism, and those who understand eternal knowledge through those born of the word and the imperishable luminators, originating from the holy seed, the living water. Now in my chapters, I close with my final thoughts. So I'll go ahead and read them here in this video. My final thoughts on the apocalypse of Adam. First off, I was surprised the initial time I read this story during my research, believing that it wasn't until the early Gnostic Christians that there was a belief that the Jewish creator God Yahweh was not the supreme being of the universe. But considering the age of this story predating Christianity and the better known Apocryphon of John by at least 450 years, it shows that even some of the ancient Jews question his claim and authority. The simple fact in which Adam and Eve, in this case, were abducted from the internal realm and brought to the earthly realm gives credence to the beliefs held by the authors who penned the works that came at a later date. Next, the author of this original text claims that Adam was aware that Cain was not his son, but the son of the Demiurge, who trapped him and Eve in his garden to till the soil. But I found it fascinating that even though this point was brought up, Adam never mentioned Abel, as if he had never existed, or for that fact, the conflict that happened between the two brothers. I also found it intriguing how the story of the Great Flood was incorporated into this tale as a vision given to Adam from the Aeons. My question is, could the angelic being who prophesies this to Adam have been one of the three names given in this tale? or that of Elalith, who rescued Naria from the Archons. Moving on, the coming of the Great Illuminator sounds like another prophecy of the coming Son of Man. The story describes how he will not be seen for who he is and that they will basically persecute him. The simple statement of will perform signs and wonders is more than enough to link this being to what was written about Yeshua in the New Testament. However, I don't know about you, but the description of the 13 kingdoms seemed somewhat redundant. But as in the later Gnostic Christianity, this text, to me anyway, seems to show that salvation is found through the gnosis of knowing our true selves and not that of blindly following the teachings of our captor or in the words of the story, we will live eternally having resisted the corruption of the desires and the deeds of the powerful beings, the Archons who trapped us here. That was an incredible story. I think I made it through over 23 minutes of reading aloud from what I had written without too many errors. It's really difficult. Anyone who's ever sat in a classroom and listened to the, a teacher or a professor lecture understands this. But with that, now the final housekeeping. Of course, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. If you want to help support me, you can check out my books on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble. They are considered horror. As I've said in the past, Lost Cannibal Manifesto and the Inferno Effect have much deeper meanings than what is on the surface. Anyway, as this video is getting a little bit long, I'll go ahead and close. I'll see you again next time. I love you all. Bye.